Lee Allerhoff is a second year PhD student in the School of English. His supervisor is also Philip Gold, and his dissertation is titled Golden Apples of the Monkey House, Myth in the Short Stories of Ray Bradbury and Ray, um, Ray Vonnegut, Kurt Vonnegut. And today he'll be speaking on Return of the Subaltern, what the Ewoks of Star Wars reveal about the primitive other. So please welcome Steve. I, um, I should begin this talk with the full disclosure that the first film I saw in a movie theater was Return of the Jedi. My father took me when I was three years old, and it's one of my very first memories. Also, um, given the proliferation of Star Wars Apocrypha, I need to point out that I'm only discussing the live-action Ewok films. So that's Return of the Jedi, The Caravan of Courage, and The Battle for Endor. I will not be discussing Ewoks, the animated series, so <laughs> I'm sorry to anybody who showed up. I'm ready for that. Also, and this is the worst thing a scholar can ever admit to, but um, I did consult uh, Wikipedia <laughs> in the writing of this. In 1983, George Lucas completed the first Star Wars trilogy with Return of the Jedi. In the second and third acts, a race of teddy bearish aliens wielding bows and arrows, the Ewoks, help the Rebel Alliance defeat the Galactic Empire. Lucas has said, quote, the story really is of a very primitive society, apparently a weak society, who is able to overcome a very technological society. Audience response to the Ewoks has been mixed since their appearance, some criticizing believability. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Others uh, blaming merchandising opportunities. We dared to be cute, Lucas admits. It has been documented that Lucas was thinking of his own generation's war, the Vietnam War, when developing the Ewoks. In Star Wars and History, William J. Astor writes, quote, Like the Viet Cong in the Vietnam War, the Ewoks are smaller in stature than their enemy, and possess little in the way of advanced weaponry." End quote. In one of Astor's notes, he says, Obviously, the Ewoks and their primitive innocence are nowhere near as nasty as the real-life Viet Cong. End quote. Several points strike me. Right now, uh, it's that idea of primitive innocence because it shows up again and again. The Ewoks developed from pre-production through post-production thanks to writers, concept artists, costume makers, the actors who portrayed them, and so on. Circumstance also played a role. For instance, their hoods were fashioned as a solution for hiding the seams on the back of their masks. English production designer Norman Reynolds says, quote, I've approximated them to other primitive people, like the Aborigines or early man. They make all their weapons from natural materials, wood and stone. Yet, in some ways, they're rather like normal families, with children, parents, and so on. <laughs> My whole thinking is based on what early man would do, with all his limitations." End quote. Just uh, what does primitive mean? Astor implies innocence. Reynolds implies limitation. But Lucas suggests something else when he calls Ewok culture a very primitive society, apparently a weak society. It's the apparently there that is important. Ewok society is not weak, it's only apparently weak. Who is it apparently weak to? To Western moviegoers. In Other People's Myths, Wendy Doniger asserts, Others are important to us because we see in them not what they are, or at least not just what they are but what we think we are as distinct from them. Consider this closed captioning from the Caravan of Courage. Um, so the Ewoks play Irish trad, apparently. That was my first um, reaction. Also, I'm curious, um, this is telling us that music is emanating from the hut, but who is this music traditional to? Uh, because there are no Ewoks. They have no tradition. Their traditional music, it turns out, is made with flute and drum, which is a form of music so primitive that Jethro Tull still play it today. Um, but what about their spears and arrows? Most of us will never learn how to fashion a stone point and would never come close to doing it well without a lot of practice. 
Uh, and yet we see stone tools in museum display cases and think how primitive. Our idea of progress overlooks the sophistication required to fashion stone implements. And we're so blind to this, uh, I think, that the sight of Ewoks and leather hang gliders remains unquestioned. <laughs> in the making of Return of the Jedi, John Philip Peacher writes, the gliders suspended from the ceiling in front of the giant blue screen are magnificent looking pieces of primitive technology. The problem is that hang gliders are a distinctly modern invention uh, despite Leonardo da Vinci's sketches around 1500, controlled hang gliding was not reliably achieved until 1889 by German engineer Otto Lilienthal. The Ewoks are so good at fashioning these uh, aircraft that in the Battle for Endor, Wicket, who's just a child Ewok, is able to fashion one overnight in a cave from skins and bones that he just finds laying around. So, isn't it interesting that we relate more to the star pilots and space wizards wielding laser swords whose technologies we don't possess than the stick and stone wielding Ewoks? On an evolutionary scale, we've spent far longer living communally and using stone and wood than we have in outer space. We've only walked on the moon a mere 90 hours. That's it. Yet droids are more relatable than Ewoks how eager we are to imagine ahead and how reluctant to confront symbols of our past. Even the Ewok language, which protocol droid C-3PO can instantaneously translate, is described as a very primitive dialect. Look what happens in closed captioning when the Ewoks talk. Uh, we're presented with Ewokese. Uh, and note the orientalized word there. It isn't Ewokish or Ewokian or even the less is more Ewok it's Ewokese, like Chinese or Japanese or Vietnamese. Though some Star Wars aliens receive subtitles when speaking their own language, Ewoks are never subtitled. Actually, um, R2-D2 and many Star Wars aliens speak without subtitles. Nian Num even speaks an actual language, Haya, which is the language of the Haya who live in East Africa. A college student from Kenya named Kipsang Rotish translated and spoke Nian Num's lines. Sound editor Ben Burt says, when the film played in Nairobi, listeners in the audience were thrilled to hear their own language at Star Wars. They took it as a great honor. Kipsang became a celebrity in his home country and made the rounds of the local talk shows. Despite all that, he was uncredited in the movie. The chief linguist of Ewokis is Ben Burt. With his work on Star Wars, which demanded new sound effects for everything from lightsabers to Wookiees, he revolutionized the craft of sound design and stands decorated today with awards for his contributions to filmmaking. Heading up Sprocket Systems and Skywalker Sound, a department no less significant than Industrial Light and Magic, he built a library of noises through a wide range of methods. The sound of Jabba the Hutt licking his lips is him stirring his wife's macaroni and cheese in a bowl. Um, the Ranker's roar is his insanely uh, aggressive dachshund that lived next door to him. His philosophy is based on emotion. Quote, the key to creativity in sound design is to develop the skill to select just the right sound at just the right moment. Good sound is carefully chosen samples of meaningful noise that relate to some predictable emotional response. One of Bert's first tasks for Return of the Jedi was creating the Ewok language. Inspiration arrived when he saw a PBS documentary about the Kalmyk, a people of China and Mongolia. I thought, wow, he says, this language is very interesting. It has something we haven't heard before. It seems like it would be something good for the Ewoks. After auditioning a Tibetan gift shop owner and his father, someone found a Kalmyk speaker. Better yet, she was an elderly woman. Why? Bert explains. Quote, I discovered that alien voices are particularly credible if the listener cannot clearly identify the age and gender of the original speaker. This ambiguous quality relieves the voice from any associative bias. If the voice is created by a child or an old man, for instance, no matter what you do, it still will probably be recognized as just what it is. However, I found elderly female voices to be a superb starting point for aliens. <laughs> Bert remembers
remembers the Kalmyk woman, Leslie. We finally, through some research, came into contact with some refugees who had come from that part of China. And a particular elderly woman, she was probably in her 80s, was brought to us. She didn't speak English. She had recently immigrated from primitive regions of China. She had lived in a tribe as a, some kind of a quasi-nomadic existence all her life. And she probably didn't really understand what we were trying to do in recording her voice for a movie. As he did when recording people who are not professional performers, he asked her to tell traditional folk tales and act out the different characters' voices if she could. She wanted a bottle of vodka, he recalls, and we provided that for her, and she got very lucid and gave us some wonderful sounds. <laughs> we referred to this woman as Grandma Vodka because we couldn't pronounce her real name. Whatever her name was, it's never been published. A short clip of her talking is included with J.W. Rinsler's 2010 book, The Sounds of Star Wars. I'd like to play that for you. Uh, so no translation accompanies that. Bert isolated phrases he liked, wrote them out phonetically as he heard them, and recorded people with distinctive voices delivering them. The words, he writes, were a mixture of mock Tibetan, Kalmyk, and even a bit of Native American Lakota. The principal contributors formed a somewhat poetic roll call, Kozi Unkov, Lama Kunga Jr., Lama Kunga the Elder, MK Nepali, Kendup, and Ditri Daza. A woman named Adil Krums provided Wicket's voice. And yes, even Grandma Vodka, the matriarch of Iwakis can be heard in the film. Bert says, one of the favorite recordings we got from this elderly Chinese woman was a little song that she sang, which you'll hear as they pass the firewood. It's probably based on some Chinese folk song. I really don't know. Notice how she's gone from Kalmyk to Chinese there too. Um, that scrap of song is sung as Ewoks build a fire to roast Han Solo. And just listen closely. <laughs> Whatever her song means, uh, it's mixed into a, the historical and Pulp Fiction motif of cannibals attempting to cook heroes for dinner. To my knowledge, uh, no one has cried foul over Grandma Vodka. Writing last year for the Mongol American blog, Michael Aaron Rockland says, Anyone who has seen the Star Wars movies has heard Kalmyk spoken. Um, sure, you know, we've heard bits of it and imitations of it, but we haven't understood it. Having one foot in post-colonialism, I can't help hearing Gayatri Spivak asking, can the subaltern speak? Uh, I'm not going to make the mistake of trying to speak on behalf of the woman we know as Grandma Vodka. I know nothing about the Kalmyks and their language, and I wouldn't dare to pretend otherwise. Uh, Bert is very upfront and unabashed about his own lack of knowing. And it's important to acknowledge that a post-colonial reading doesn't line up neatly. The Kalmyks were not colonized by Americans. Furthermore, no one has claimed to understand Grandma Vodka or the power dynamics surrounding her role in the making of these films, which was to inspire fictitious language that sounded exotic and foreign to Western ears. In his methods, Ben Burt, who hears sound in ways most people do not, consciously put himself in a position of hearing without understanding. Following his subjective sense of elderly women's voices, he went about poaching her recorded voice in an act of unintelligible appropriation. In explaining his method of using her voice to create an alien tongue, Burt outs himself as an alien to Kalmyk. I don't for a second believe that Bert and Lucas set out to exploit a little old lady from northwestern China for their movie about stormtroopers and teddy bears, but uh, it could also be argued that the construction of Iwakis was at least insensitive. And what fascinates me most is that this subaltern can speak, and she did speak, and we can hear her, but we have no idea what she's saying at all. I can't find anything indicating the stories that she told Ben Burt have been made available or translated. After Return of the Jedi, 
Lucasfilm produced two movies that featured Ewoks, The Caravan of Courage and The Battle for Endor. The first film opens after the Tawani family's star cruiser has crash landed on the forest moon of Endor. Mom and Dad are promptly abducted by a terrible giant called the Gorax. Mace and his sister Sindel become the Hansel and Gretel of Endor, wandering into the care of the Ewoks. Their host family is the Warwicks, Deej, Shodu, and their children, Weechi, Whittle, Wicket, and a baby. Wicket, of course, is the iconic Ewok from Return of the Jedi. Wikipedia, this is where I have my beef with Wikipedia, claims these movies take place prior to Return of the Jedi, but I reject that outright. <laughs> um, if that were the case, Wicket would greet Princess Leia in English, and there'd be no confusion about cooking Han Solo. Uh, prior contact would also explain why the Ewoks don't try to roast the Tawani children. Uh, so these movies must take place after Return of the Jedi, despite no reference to the Ewoks' fight against the Imperials, uh, no burned-out bunkers or vehicles. Caravan is interestingly uh, narrated by Burl Ives, best remembered by me as Sam the Snowman in the 1964 stop-motion Christmas special Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. The adventurers gather for a traditional Ewok ceremony. Before they depart, Logre must bestow upon them the sacred totems of the legendary Ewok warriors. He explains the Ewok's use of skin gliders and medicinal trees, the village mystics' rituals, etc., giving the feel of old PBS documentaries in which an American or English narrator described the customs of people living in various jungles. In a similar way, the Ewoks are presented as xenoanthropological specimens, introducing to a young target audience our own tendency to study other cultures. And along the way, Sindel teaches wicked English. His first sentence is Star Cruiser Crash. Sindel's older brother Mace, who's in that whole 14-year-old um, ethnocentric phase, um, he tries to ruin the lesson here with a bit of racism. What were you guys talking about? About the Star Cruiser and the crash. Come on, Sindel, get an IQ. He can't talk. He can talk. Talk, talk. Boy, got Star Cruiser. You hit your crash, crash, Mace, uh, he goes on to call them walking hairbrushes and animals. Uh, no, they're not, Sindel says. I like them. Wicket is the only Ewok to learn English. Sindel and Mace never learn any Ewokese. By the beginning of the Battle for Endor, Wicket is the only bilingual character, an Ewok squanto. After marauders kill Sindel's family, she's rescued by Noah, who's played by Wilford Brimley. And she leaves her adopted Ewok family for life with the Quaker Oats guy. Wicket, given the idea of leaving with her, says, No, Ewok live here, Wicket's family here. And so, Heidi of Endor is restored to the care of a grandfatherly miser, presenting a narrative in which blonde girls belong with old white guys, while aliens belong with aliens. It's a reversal of the farewell ending in E.T., the extraterrestrial uh, where in E.T., separation is fueled by the urgent threat of serious danger. Separation in the battle for Endor comes because the shipwrecked humans have finally found a way to leave. Goodbye, not good, Sindel says, but she promises to come back and visit Wicket as soon as she can. E.T. and Elliot share no such promise. The live-action Ewok films all present the idea that judging others is inferior and oneself is superior is hazardous to everybody involved. Imperial weaponry is brought down by timber. The insufferable teenager finally learns that Ewoks are equals, not animals. The archetype of the noble savage is employed in a liberal effort to humanize the hypothetical other. It's interesting that Ben Burt turned to the language of a people he describes with words like tribesmen, primitive, and quasi-nomadic 
to cobble a language for an alien race designed to be symbolically primitive to American audiences. He did not turn to a language from the West. His sense of Kalmyk as exotic is, if problematic, at least honest. Of course, Kalmyk wouldn't have sounded exotic at all in the ears of the woman known to us as Grandpa Vodka. In Bert's artistic game of telephone, most of the original Kalmyk has likely been rendered into gibberish. Had the rap taken with Kipsang Rotish, the Haya man from Kenya, been taken with the Ewoks actually speaking Kalmyk, we might wonder what implications that would have brought. Perhaps a global ectic reading of Star Wars as a global text is appropriate, a method Gugi Wathiango encourages. Quote, like a mirror or a camera, a work of art may reveal more than consciously intended. Works of imagination refuse to be bound within national geographies. They leap out of nationalist prisons and find welcoming fans outside the geographic walls. But they can also encounter others who would want to put them back within the walls as if they were criminals on the loose." End quote. These films, made in England and the USA, are part of a series that has found international success and grown into not just a franchise for Disney to purchase, but an accessible mythology recognizable to people around the world. We can't reduce Ewoks to mere allegory for American foreign policy. And what do the Ewoks reveal about the primitive other? Uh, not much about so-called primitive cultures. They do, however, embody and evoke anxieties we have about our own progress that we would rather leave unconscious.